My dears, we hope that we have touched your hearts in the way that you have touched ours. And we hope that you will all go out into the world happy and with no more of that pesky little existential dread in on we, yes? <laughs> and most of all, we hope that you will never forget us your dear friends, the Linguini sisters, and know that we love you very much. Master, how do you say don't forget in Italian? It's very easy. Non dimenticar. worked for some of the greatest film directors in Europe and in the United States, and then they launched their nightclub act, which in many ways actually eclipsed their film career. It was unprecedented. Uh, they just walked away from a huge film career, and they started singing in nightclubs. Dietrich was the only other person that I could think of that did that, but you know, she was, her film career was basically over when she started doing a nightclub act. The Linguini sisters, at the top of their game. Well, they set fashion trends no one even realizes. Anxiosa made hat chic again, well, briefly, but American women were cutting their hair just like Fabulosos. They're responsible for so much more. People don't even know about it. They never got the credit they deserved. Their nightclub act broke attendance records everywhere they played. They finally had to book the Winter Garden Theater just so they could accommodate all their fans. And even so, it was impossible to get in. It was the hottest ticket in New York. And then all the trouble started. Anxiosa left the act. It was an enormous scandal. The papers had a field day. All right, so let, let's start from the beginning. Your twin sisters, but one of you is French and the other is Italian. How can that be? Oh, my dear. Even after all these years, people still ask that question. It's very simple, really. You see, actually, we are F twins. We were born on exactly the same day, at exactly the same time. I was born here in France, and Fabulosa was born in Italy. Uh, we had different mothers, you see, uh, but we have the same father. Well, of course, you know him, the great Italian cinematographer, Ardente Linguini, the crocodile. Bestia! Oh, the beast! Imagine him saying he never heard of us. Her own father! As if we needed anything from him. Uh, but but uh, Fabulosa and I did not meet until much, much later. It was at the end of World War II. We met in a refugee camp on the Italian-French border. I was in a soup line. It was in a camp for refugees on the French-Italian border. I was ladling out the soup that I had just prepared myself when I saw Fabulosa for the first time. She looked like hell, by the way. Our eyes met, and we knew instantly that we were sisters. It was an incredible moment, so beautiful, so profoundly moving. The soup was delicious. Obviously, they both had terrible, terrible childhoods. They were young girls during the war, you know. They used to hate to talk about those years, especially when they hit it big. The press accused them of all sorts of terrible things. Well, no. No, really. I think that all these rumors are terribly preposterous. I ask you, how could I possibly be in Berlin, Moscow, and Tokyo all at the same time, eh? Yes, and I was just a little thing living the pastoral life of a simple country girl in my ancestral village of Abondanza, where we were forced to sell our favorite, uh, no, our family jewels for the barest necessity. Yes, lipstick and hot stockings, champagne. So tell us more about your new film. Ah, see, sí, see, sí. it is called Savage New Worlds. It is a costume piece set in old New York. I am working with Milos Forman for the first time. He is a genius. A genius. It's also the first time I work with my sister in almost 30 years. 
since she broke up our nightclub act to go and do those ridiculous plays of hers. You know, she try and put the blame on Fabulosa for boosting up the act. She say, Fabulosa want to be big recording star by herself. This is not the truth. No. They came to me and asked me to make records after she left to go on the stage. Axiosa believes that Fabulosa knew how badly she wanted to do live theater and used that as an excuse to break up the act. Well, whatever happened, the act did break up. Anxiosa had already had a taste of theater. She replaced Daniel Derriere and played a year in Coco. <music> then the act got back together. Then they made their last movie together, Bitter Escarole. They were on the Ed Sullivan show that year. Then suddenly it was all over. Anxiosa opened her own playhouse down on Avenue C, and things sort of, well, went downhill from there. Her last play, Return of the Trojan Women, left her practically bankrupt. I swore that I would never make another film, especially not with uh, the Italian. But as soon as I read the script, I knew that I had to do it. It's brilliant. It touches so many feminist issues. It's called Savage New Worlds. And we play two women who have traveled from Europe to teach good manners and social skills to young American ladies. I think that I have the better of the two roles. <laughs> Fabulosa is merely a supporting player. The story is very dramatic. It's based on actual events and full of intrigue, betrayals and perversions. I can't wait to begin filming. And I have the starring role, really. Too bad my sister doesn't get much to do. Honestly, I think this is the best part I have had since the last time we worked for Federico in uh, 1956. Well, we made three films with him. Our first was in 1947, Sing Today, Cry Tomorrow. Oh. What an incredible experience. It was wonderful and horrible at the same time making that picture. We worked with all these beautiful, creative people, but the waiting, waiting between the shots, oh, such torture, a veritable preview of hell itself. That one little scene in the Piazza San Marco that everyone loves so much took four days to shoot. Sing Today, Cry Tomorrow was the Linguini sisters' first film. Fellini saw them singing on a street corner while he was making the film and he wrote them into it. They were only in two scenes, but they stole the picture and they were an instant hit with the European audiences. Gina, senti cara, mettono questo best and no no no. In English, because we go to New York, I am to bring these dresses to New York for fashion shoot, so must to be extra careful with them when pressing. And when you are finished, pack in trunk, wrap in tissue paper first. Si, yes, signora. Ma Gina, andiamo! Ancora you are pressing the same dress. It will be out of fashion by the time you are finished. Più presto, eh? Andiamo! Si, yes, signora. Oh. oh, you must excuse Fabulosa. She become a little nervous when she make a new movie. Really, I love this girl. La bella Gina is a treasure, un tesoro. I kiss her. You know she is my cousin, but uh, then again, the entire Linguini family is on the payroll, and after the term of abundance, it's just ridiculous. Even the priest, he come up to me yesterday, he said, Signora Linguine, we need more money, we must to fix the organ in the church. I said, what do I look like? Some kind of a bank? Everybody come to me, they want this money. They... <sighs> uh, now, what was I telling you? Ah, see, si. Anxiosa. Well, she was always easier to work with when we did our nightclub act than when we were filming. She's a brilliant actress, 
And I don't say that simply because she is my sister. But she is so... Uh, la melancolia, eh, how you say English? Uh, melancholy? She came to me say, Fabulosa, I need more fulfillment artistic. I want to take some time off from the act and work on the stage. And Fabulosa say, Yes, of course, dear. Do whatever it is you must to do. So she does that play for a year. Coco. Then we get back together. Time passes and she said to me, Fabulosa, I want to do another play. And Fabulosa said, Yes, dear, go and do whatever it is you must to do. And then one day, she just not come back. And those plays, Madonna, you never seen nothing so sad. All this, life has no meaning, life is hell. Who needs it? Now, I, Fabulosa, love life. I love to be in front of people who adore me. years that the Linguinis were performing in nightclubs, they had a sort of friendly rivalry going on with Malena Dietrich, who was Anxios's dear close personal friend. Well, close friendship or not, that didn't stop Marlena from always comparing her box office receipts to the sisters. The Linguinis always drew bigger crowds and it drove Marlena crazy. She was so jealous. But Marlena used to say that the Linguinis had bigger numbers because there were two of them <laughs> and only one of her. They came backstage to meet me one night after my, I was just starting my cabaret act. And uh, they came into the dressing room, the smallest, tiniest dressing room in the entire world probably. Here I am with the two most glamorous women in movies. And they're telling me how much they liked me. It was, it was an amazing experience. You know, Anxiosa still sends me a Christmas card every year. Amazing. Of all their films, my favorite has to be Le Signorine, their last with Federico Fellini. After Sing Today, Cry Tomorrow, they graduated to slightly larger parts in Olives on the Table, made in 1948. And then, not even 10 years later, they were big stars, so Fellini gave them the starring roles. It's a controversial film, though, because so much of Anxios's part was cut, and no one ever seemed to be able to explain why. Museum is loosely based on the fascinating story of Il Maestro Lorenzo de Ponti, who was once librettist for Wolfgang Mozart. Uh, having been chased across Europe by angry husbands and creditors, he has finally landed on the shores of the New World, in New York City, in fact. But, alas, history repeats itself. And he has fallen on hard times once again. How is shooting on Savage New Worlds going so far, Miss Fabulous? Oh, it's wonderful. Everyone is so nice. Uh, oh, I get everything I ask for. We finished the external shooting, and now we are here in this beautiful Merchant's House Museum for to complete the internal shoots. This is such a beautiful house, and so kind of them to, for to let us shoot here. And I adore working.
working with Milos Forman. Reminds me of all those films I make with Fellini. Ah, but where is she? Who? Who? Ansiosa. Who else? Gianni, make her come here. I've been waiting already the hour for her. Ah, uh, she's upstairs. They finished shooting her scene this morning and she went to change out of her costume. I, they're probably still doing her hair. Oh, Madonna, that hair of hers. Uh, that will take us another two hours. Unless maybe we are lucky and she get the pop to come up and make the miracle, huh? And then it will take still the hour. Darling! Andiamo, eh? Uh, uh, may we, ma soeur? I'll uh, be right there. Uh, uh, now, now, where was I? Uh, oh, 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 yes, yes. Now, I play Mademoiselle Claudette Jamais. At first glance, a refined and cultured woman of Paris who has established herself at Il Maestro's school, teaching music, French, and embroidery to the young ladies. But she has led a lonely, tragic life, as we learn later, and now has found a safe harbor under the protective wing of Il Maestro. She even dares to allow herself to imagine that someday he will propose marriage to her, and she will be happy at last. But sadly, it is not to be. Now, one night, Il Maestro and Claudette take a few of their favorite pupils on a cultural outing to see a performance of The Barber of Seville at New York City's new Italian Opera House. There, on the stage, singing the role of Rossina, is a most bewitching creature the diva, Marietta Marchesa. The maestro is captivated by her from the start. But Claudette, Claudette is horrified, for Marietta is actually Rina San Marco, sole witness to a sordid and long forgotten chapter in Claudette's early life. In a flashback, we learn that while now seemingly respectable, Many years ago, Claudette and Marietta were young girls of questionable character who sang salacious songs for the drunken rebel. Shazi! Come on now, everyone is waiting. You're holding up the works. Promised to marry her and then left her standing at the altar, abandoned, disgraced, and without a suit or a poor besmirched name. Claudette, pulled from the Seine by Marietta, is forced by her circumstances to go and work in this horrible environment. She eventually escapes and leaves her tawdry past behind her for a better life in the new world. Safe in America, she has redeemed herself and has almost forgotten her wicked past until that fateful night at the opera. I think I have found the perfect outfit. Oh, that's it. My dress is enough. Um, this is a close-up. I'm sorry. We're here. You up. cannot see my legs. Not in this particular shot. Marietta is so charming, so glamorous, so rarefied that her very presence at La Petite Corde des Femmes eclipses poor Claudette. Claudette is decimated. Everything that she has worked so hard for is now faced with destruction. Soon, a desperate power struggle ensues between Claudette and Marietta as they vie for the hand of Il Maestro. This is true. Okay. And yet, what do they really know about him? What dark secret might he be hiding beneath that veneer of noble gentility and the miasma of intellectual pursuits? For we soon learn Le petit décor des femmes is not what it would appear to be. And before long, scandal, betrayal, and even murder are revealed to be the life's blood of this shoddy institution. Claudette is dragged through the cesspool of degradation and the twin nightmares of exposure and social ostracism. This is worse than the time I worked with Marilyn Monroe. She emerges. Sadder, but wiser. 
But then, to tell you how she achieves this would reveal the denouement of our little story. Let me just say that the plot twists and turns and builds and thickens up to one hell of a climax. Apparently, the boat could not make it after all. You look lovely, my dear. Uh, thank you, my dear. I, I am so sorry that I was late. Oh, that's all right. We were all just sitting here and sitting here under the hot lights, perspiring. Um, fabulous. You were just telling me something about working with uh, Fellini. Oh, yes. What a lovely man he was. Ah, Federico was a wonderful director, one of the great geniuses of the cinema, and he indulged me so. He detested hats, but he allowed me to wear them all through our third picture, Les Signorine. He had no choice, dear. You put it in the contract, I must to wear hats. Uh, well, now, Les Signorine was a was sad... such a charming picture, really. Part comedy and part drama. Everyone remembers that scene where we danced in our bare feet in the fountain of trade. And we sang. I can tell it, my dear. And we sang with Anita Egberg and Caterina Valente. And, and, and I played the mandolin. <laughs> it is my favorite of all the films that we did with this man. I played a woman who dares to challenge society's image of femininity. You played the wife of a writer who was sleeping with half of Rome behind your back. He was sleeping with everybody, my dear. Yes, but my character gets very angry about that. It was, I believe, the most important theme in the film. But darling, how can that be? You were hardly in the picture. Just a few scenes. Yes, my dear. But those scenes are the very essence of the film. The woman I play tells her philandering, faithless husband just what she thinks of him. It was quite a daring speech for its time. And, and so difficult because I had to play someone who was the very personification of rage and jealousy. So unlike myself. <laughs> just so unlike anyone that I know. I had to scream and throw things at this monstrous man, played by my dear sweet Marcello Mastroianni, whom I truly adored. Marcello, what a loss to us all. So tragic, so talented. And what a shame, my dear, that you never got to do any scenes with him in this picture. Or ever. Apparently, he wasn't sleeping with every woman in Rome. <laughs> well, as I was saying, we had this one big dramatic scene, and I had such a hard time summoning up these terrible emotions. But I myself was feeling the stirrings of feminism at the time, so I could understand how this poor, miserable woman must have felt. It was truly ahead of its time, this scene. But, darling, as you know, the film was too long, and that was one of the first scenes they throw away. You know, when I think, they throw away most of your scenes in that picture. You play barely more than a supporting role, if I recall. And the rest, well, snip, snip, snip. Well, you know, dear, that is the movie business. Another of life's great ironies. My best acting left to disintegrate on some dusty floor in Cinecittà. I think it's very exciting that the so-called lost footage from La Signorina has finally been found. But I think it's rather odd that the missing reels turned up in a Dior hat box in the costume department at Cinecittà. But at least now we can see the film as Fellini intended it. Every time we go out, you do this to me. And fool that I am, I allow you to do it. I don't deny it, because I saw you. Your roving eye devouring every woman in that room humiliated me. 
I am your wife. Your wife. I could have had any man I wanted, but I chose you. Imbecile! I have given away all such as precious to a Philistine. My youth, my devotion, these are the treasures I have squandered on one we saw so undeserving, and, and so much more. And what have I received in return? Betrayal, lies, degradation. I hate you! Sylvia, che fai? Carlo? Oh, Carlo, Carlo, mon amour. You do love me, you do. What a fool I was to doubt you. It is I who have been blind. Forgive me, darling, can you? I love you. I love you. Carlo. Even all cut up, I still think it was one of our best films. And you know, Fabulosa didn't even want to do it at first. I had to talk her into it. I was exhausted. That was uh, 1956. And as you know, I had already made two pictures back to back. I had only three weeks to myself before I was to leave for the United States for to make that film with uh, Mr. Cooker. So she got Federico to reschedule his entire shooting schedule so we could be in Le Signorine and he filmed all our scenes in just two weeks. And the only thing you have to talk me into was to take that stupid boat to go over when I wanted to fly. Wait, wait, I, I thought that you needed the, the time to unwind between pictures. Perhaps a week at sea? A week at sea? She booked us on the Andrea Doria. Well, how was I supposed to know that it was going to sink? And who bothered you anyway? The passengers didn't even recognize you until uh, that last night when you insisted on getting up after dinner and singing Arriva del Ceroma. And then that big ship from Sweden crashed into us right in the middle of my hunger. The Andrea Doria lurched to starboard. Everyone started screaming. We thought that it was going to roll over right then and take us into the bottom of the green Atlantic. Fortunately, that wretched ship managed to stay afloat through the night just long enough for everyone to get off safely. We stand on the deck all night and sing the inspirational songs for to maintain the calm until the very last passenger get into the very last lifeboat. And then we persuade the poor captain not to go down with the ship, but to live with us. Such a nice man. And of course we were rescued by that magnificent French ship, the Ile de France. It was on its way to Europe, but it turned right around to come back to rescue all of us from that poor, unfortunate, inferior, weak and crippled Italian ship. I still say we should have flown Alitalia. They were given a hero's welcome when they got to New York. Then they got on a plane for Hollywood to make Do As The Romans Do with George Cukor. I think it was their only successful American picture together. Fabulosa was a wonderful comedian. She had flawless timing and Cukor really created a perfect vehicle for her. And the film cemented the sisters' long friendship with George Cukor. They never worked together again, although God knows they certainly tried to find another project, but he was a tremendous influence on them. And this was the first film where a good portion of the budget was set aside just for the sisters' wardrobe. A very clever move on Cukor's part. See, he assumed that they would get coverage in all the fashion magazines, but for the most part, the costumes were overlooked. It seemed to happen to them a lot. Well, there was this one picture I remember. It was with Fabulosa. 
It was um, La Regina de Settimari, that's it. Now this film was made in the late 40s, years before they made the original version of Sabrina. And there's this wonderful, wonderful, big, fat, gorgeous close-up of Fabulosa standing near the bow of some ship. And she's wearing, I'm not sure, it's some leotard or sweater thing, but very high in the front with a deep V in the back, black, so beautiful. She looks gorgeous in it. She's gazing out at the sea. Then along comes Audrey Hepburn, years later, in Sabrina, in the same top, in a scene with Humphrey Bogart. Edith Head probably did this costume. And the next thing you know, every girl in America wants that Sabrina sweater. They couldn't keep it on the shelves. And Audrey and Sabrina get all the credit. Fabulosa, nothing. Although I strive to be glamorous, at all times, I was never afraid to take the risks in my work. I always think that little sweater make me look like the peasant until the director tell me that in that part of the film, I am the peasant. Looking back, I think I actually look quite lovely. I am just staring out at the horizon, thinking about nothing except Greta Garbo. You were thinking about Garbo? Not in that way, dear. I was thinking about Garbo in Queen Christina. She stayed on the boat, and they tell her, think of nothing. And so she think of nothing, and it makes the beautiful shout. I do the same thing. I think of nothing. And that was my first picture, where I make them put La Regina in the title. You know this? With only a few exceptions, the early films mostly, when I do not have the artistic control, all my films have La Regina in the title. Uh, the film where I wear the sweater, La Regina dei Sette Mari, uh, La Regina dell'Opera, uh, Diana dea Regina, I, and you know, when I not put Regina in the title, I have the character name Regina. It become like the good luck charm for me. And so, when they say, no, they will not accommodate me and put Regina, then I say, well, Fabulosa not accommodate you and I not make the film. Uh, that is why I am not in Ship of Fools or Ben Hur or Airport. They would not use La Regina. What is so bad with La Regina di Ben Hur? Eh? Well, of course, I break this tradition for this film, Savage New Worlds, because of my dear Milos. Besides, they dress me so good in this, I look like the queen anyway. Well, you know, it's odd. She's so glamorous, but the critics seem to prefer her in the earthy peasant roles. They credit her for taking on-screen risks, like in the Richard Pisons of the Trembling Earth. She wore a little makeup and a tattered gown all the way through the picture. Well, actually, it was about 30 different versions of the same gown. It had to fade and age and get torn and filthy. Well, the story took place in the last two months of World War II, so it had to. But by the end of the picture, they couldn't bleach it anymore, so they just turned the dress inside out, and it looked even older. Ah, recit paesan of the trembling earth. I paesani sciagurati dalla terra tremante. I make that with Roberto eh, when... 51, 52. I play a, una partigiana, uh, a partisan, a brave resistance fighter during World War II. We filmed it on the streets of Rome. I went about in rags, how uh, you say, tatters. Uh, because, of course, during the war, who had money for washing machines or even to buy clothes then? I delivered secret code messages to the other members of the underground resistance. Usually I bake them in a pot pastry or sometimes I eat them in a cannoli. I tell you something nobody else knows. I paid with my own money for special English language version to be released in the United States. In fact, I wrote the English translation myself. <laughs> You found me, and now you know the truth. I am a partisan. What we do? Kill me? Go ahead, for it is Italy I love, not you, you Nazi card. 
But remember, when I die, a thousand brave souls will rise up and take my place. Slit my throat with your knife, ragazzino. A thousand voices will take my place and pierce the darkness with the songs of truth. Quando muoio, partigiano, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 quando muoio. Oh, oh, oh. You know, Hollywood used to copy everything they wore on and off screen. Do you remember that uh, little thing with uh, Anxiosa and the dress that Elizabeth Taylor wore in A Place in the Sun? She made a film with Julianne Duvivier, Say Chic, Say Twist, I think, and she, she shows up at this dinner party in the most gorgeous white ball gown. She looks ethereal, and I think Duvivier was the only director to really capture how ravishing and graceful she is. Well, anyway, there she is in this white dress, and she's playing this really emotional scene. She gets rave reviews, but no one mentions this dress. Then a couple of years later, Edith Head makes an almost identical version for Elizabeth Taylor in A Place in the Sun. And all of a sudden, every debutante in America is wearing a copy of that damn dress. Anxiosa deserves the credit, and even I don't know who designed this dress. It could have been from her own wardrobe, for all I know. Well, uh, well, what can I say? Uh, fashion, it comes, it goes, and we, we age and change and fall into little bits, and eventually it, uh, we die. And my movie costumes will still be preserved somewhere in some museum, uh, while the rest of us are nothing more than dust. <laughs> the irony, the, the, the injustice. All right, all. that is it. Enough. Oh, fabulous. Uh, master, uh, come back, darling. I am tired of all this existential nonsense. Basta! Should we stop the film? No, 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 keep going. Well, just because we are sisters, it does not mean that we uh, think alike. Uh, she loves life, embraces it with all her heart. Uh, yet I see it as nothing more than a miserable crawl towards the grave. After several interruptions and uh, reconciliations, uh, I think the act finally broke up officially in, it was 1978. It was Fabulosa that finally just, you know, pushed Anxiosa out of it, out of the picture, totally. Uh, I think, I'm sure, Anxiosa had had it by then anyway. And um, she started doing these uh, off-off Broadway, you know, the women's plays? Yeah, that was what happened to her. Well, uh, at the time, I thought that it was uh, the right thing to do. Yes, in retrospect, maybe I might not have put so much of my own money into my production of Return of the Trojan Women, but I believed so strongly in it. I believed in all of my plays. I still do. My greatest disappointment was not being able to produce the musical I wrote based on our bodies, ourselves. I think that would have been a great triumph. But it was not to be. Another of life's cruel ironies, no? I wasn't smart and I lost my heart on the Paris skies. Don't ever be a heartbroken stranger like me. Yes, I fell in love. Yes, I was a fool. For Paris can be so beautifully cruel. Paris is just a gay coquette that wants to love and then forget. Stranger, beware. 
Just love in the air. Just look and see what happened to me under Paris sky. Watch what you do is the same thing might happen to you. Well, you know, they were such great singers. I was always surprised no one really ever used them in a musical. Well, Ross Hunter wanted to use Fabulosa in the Anna Magnani role for the musical remake of The Rose Tattoo. But then Ross went and made the musical remake of Lost Horizon instead. Cuker was desperate to work with him again. And after the success of My Fair Lady, Warner Brothers kept trying to find another musical for him to direct. Well, when Katherine Hepburn said she didn't want to do the film version of Coco, <laughs> the studio snapped it up for Anxiosa. I mean, after all, she had played it for a year on Broadway. It would have been wonderful, but somehow the deal fell through. They also wanted to film the story of Edith Piaf, with Anxiosa playing opposite Marlon Brando. She was devastated when that one fell through. Brando really wanted to do it, too. Anxiosa was supposed to do the Singing Nun, which would have been brilliant casting. Instead, I got Debbie Reynolds. In the early 70s, Fabulosa missed a second chance to work with Brando. Francis Coppola wanted Morgana King to play the wife of Don Corleone in The Godfather right from the start, but the studio was pushing Fabulosa. Paramount wanted superstars in the credits, and at the time, Diane Keaton, Al Pacino, James Caan, they were just starting their film careers. I mean, the biggest star they had in the cast was Brando. The script called for Mrs. Corleone to sing in Italian at her daughter's wedding, so Fabulosa Linguini seemed like the perfect choice. Oh, it, yeah, at the beginning, Fabulosa really wanted that part. I mean, Hollywood have been trying to get Fabulosa and Marlon Brando together for years. So it was very surprising when she finally turned it down. It was reported that Fabulosa backed out because of scheduling conflicts. But the real reason was, first of all, she insisted on playing the character at about 30 years old, which would have been impossible. Also, she wanted more than one song. And she also wanted them to change the title of the film to... Queen of the Mafia. Can you imagine Fabulosa as Mrs. Corleone, the Queen of the Mafia? Oh, please. Let's fall in love. Why shouldn't we fall in love? Our hearts are made of it. Take a chance when we are of it. Anxiosa had this sense of uh, post-war rootlessness. You know, there was that existentialist uh, quality thing about her. I don't know. She'd go into a club and hear people, you know, in a club, people want to, they want to have a good time. They're drinking, they're laughing. And Anxiosa, she wouldn't let it go. You know, in her act, it was all, you're going to die and life is terrible. And uh, Piaf, for an example, would work in, uh, a song, you know, a tragic song here and there, but Anxiosa, well, I mean, compared to, to Anxiosa, Piaf was positively sunny. I, I, I can't help it. This is what I believe. And that is why, ultimately, I moved towards the theater, because I knew it was there, and only there, that I could find true self-expression. I was tired of limiting myself to singing in nightclubs. I wanted to act. Hollywood was offering me nothing but garbage. Film, 
Well, what is it anyway? Meaningless, ephemeral, transitory, and such exhausting work, too. But, but darling, it was so glamorous and such fun. Well, it wasn't fun for me. Even now, as much as I believe in our new film project, uh, what does it really mean in the grand scale of the universe? We are but specks of dust and we're gone so quickly. Uh, what is life after all? Uh, one long, pointless, pointless wail of pain and despair. Oh, enough of this already! I am so tired of this existential nonsense! Johnny, make a darling, please. Not share. You basta, basta, as, basta, as no do. Do. You were there no, the night that you should have seen that. Stop. The night that you were dead to be a habit. You heard the ruthlessness and post-war depression that would soon come to the like a fall from hell. The chasm of alienation that rips apart the living. Keep with the index finger when you hit the ground. That's the index finger being like an accident. What? 
Do you want Stanislavski or Expressionism? Make up your mind. I just want you to turn and glance her way. And then Because if I am natural, <laughs> that means I am bored with life. My favorite Fabulosa record? Oh, it would have to be the one she did in the 70s, Fabulosa and Friends. That's an amazing album. I mean, how in the world did she convince Ella Fitzgerald, Maureen McGovern, Vicki Sue Robinson, Casey and the Sunshine Band, Tony Orlando, and One of Dawn to sing Funiculi Funicula with her? It's amazing. Amazing. No, 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 Mr. John. I, I, I think you misunderstand many things. <laughs> All right. Darling, I think we have to get a new film director right, now. I missed my teeth. <laughs> I hear that they're not even sisters. I heard they're not even women. <laughs> She tried to put the blame on Fabulosa for busting up the act. Somebody no turned the script. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. And I tried to remember what sorry. next line was. But <laughs> Fabulosa, she has no head for words. Okay, let's let's try it again. She remember mm -hmm. a man face anytime. You're right. <laughs> you show me a man, I never forget him. But okay. the words have Good. <laughs>